um, if institutional racism might, in its most simple definition, be understood as the unjust maintenance and unequal distribution of power and access based on presumed difference, then how do we push our institutions beyond such bleak yet undeniable true realities? Even if our individual intentions are not to practice racism, our institutions may maintain power through racist structures. In the wake of the recent global anti-racism mobilization, activists like numerous other stakeholder groups have registered growing distrust in the promises made by institutions to contribute to anti-racist futures. Coupled with a certain impatience, some of these criticisms come, could be read at worst as calls for the abolish, abolishment of institutions that seem so stubbornly resistant to change. And in their least, it could be seen as a giving up on institutions, a giving up on the structures that seem to embody these racializing structures. I want to welcome you to our third in a series of conversations from the Research Center for Material Culture, but more importantly, from the National Museum of World Cultures to try and think through futures where racism has no place and the work that museums and other cultural institutions can do to sketch those kinds of futures. As some of you who are joining us for the third time or the second time will know that this series emerged in the aftermath of the global mobilization recently um, in support of struggles against racism that saw the death, the violent death of George Floyd in the US. These anti-racism mobilization did not stay in the US, however, but were here as well across Europe and in the Netherlands and museums were implicated um, by many activists as in, uh, institutional structure where racism continues to hold, keep hold in our societies today. We at the National Museum of World Cultures wanted to listen rather than only speak. We wanted to state our commitment to an anti-racist future, but also we wanted to be in conversation, to lay bare our own complicity in these structures and to try to learn how to fashion together these non-racialized anti-racist futures. Today, we're going to have a conversation around the question of what to do with institutions. Can institutions be trusted? How can institutions actually contribute to anti-racist futures? If in our previous conversation, we were more internally oriented, for example, we had directors of other institutions such as Lonnie Bunch from the Smithsonian or Melanie Keane from London's Wellcome Trust and our own director, Skens Honevoort. We have in our second discussion, we spoke with another director, Sarah Wajid and Quincy Gario and a few other activists such as Julian Esenias about the internal structures of the institution. We want now to listen to outside, to others outside who are suggesting to us recently that they are tired, that they want to give up, that after years of years of promise, the museum might not be a place to be trusted. We want to put them in a little bit of an impossible position, however, to ask at the end, yes, we might not be trustable, <laughs> that you cannot trust us, but still let us think of ways, possibilities that might push us in directions where some levels of trust can be embedded. Because we as a museum believe that this anti-racist work is so urgent that we cannot absolutely do it alone. So let us see how we can try and think about how to fashion it together. 
Today we have speakers, Vincent um, von Felser, we have Nosa um, Imag Hodo, we have Simona Zefak, and we have Charles Esch, all who will share from their different perspective on this question of what to do with institutions. We're going to start out with Vincent, and I'm going to introduce each speaker first. They're going to give a small presentation, a small statement, and then we're going to get into conversation. Vincent von Felser is an Amsterdam-based writer, editor, critic, and curator. He has a background in business and administration, as well as architecture and art history. Von Felser frequently writes for, in, for individual artists, galleries, larger and smaller institutions, and magazines, amongst which the Dutch contemporary art magazine Metropolis M, at which he holds the position of contributing editor. He created exhibitions for Frame of Frame, Nest to Hague, and tent in Rotterdam, amongst other places. Vincent has been not close enough to us, and we are we are embarrassed by that. So we want to invite him to be a part of our ongoing conversation more, because he's been too far from us so far. So Vincent, welcome, and let us start the conversation and hope that it's this beginning of a of a of a collaboration in thinking about what anti-racist futures are. You have the the, the mic. Thank you, Wayne, um, and thanks for the invitation. I've always felt very close to you in a way, uh, <laughs> as well as Amal, of course, uh, who I want to thank for the invitation as well. And uh, like all the people I cannot see on Zoom right now, who I hope are um, healthy and sane in these uh, complicated times some days. Um, and I want to start with uh, making an excuse maybe for the language and the nuance as uh, I'm mostly writing and because I like to be precise and my talking, especially in English might not be as precise as my writing because it's talking and I cannot edit it after. And of course, English is not my native language. Um, my new anguish. Um, anyway, um, so like the language I'm using right now is mainly something I uh, picked up on from music, I guess, and also of course from school and whatever more. Um, and it influences like the music I've listened to throughout my youth and maybe today still influence my general polemical stance, I guess. And then when you were when Wayne just mentioned the word activist, I was thinking maybe I'm considering activist some days because of the awareness of uh, politics. And that's something uh, that I will address also in uh, what I'm about to say. Um, also including or maybe I'm starting out with I will uh, show like a small video in a bit and um, which relates to the US, like the American experience, I'll call it, let's call it like that. Um, and it's about like this discourse in this culture that has been important in a way to like my own like home environment, which is like the Dutch context. And we've been using these things from the US context a lot and maybe not always in the right ways. But uh, I like to kind of start out with something that's American and then I'll explain uh, why I'll why I use it here. So I think I yeah, great. The thing is so many stuff is so much stuff to worry about. You know, the more you know, the more you don't know and shit. You know, like a lot of people be telling me, Dave, you know, you just gotta relax. The racism thing be bugging you too much. I be thinking about it. Sometimes shit will happen. You know, a lot of black people can relate to this. Have you ever had something happen that was so racist that you didn't even get mad? You were just like, God damn, that was racist. That was racist. <laughs> I mean, it was so blatant. You were just like, wow. Like, you almost like it didn't even happen to you. It was like a fucking movie. That was a, like he was watching Mississippi burning. Wow. <laughs> That happened to me. I, I was in Mississippi. I was in Mississippi doing a show, and I go to a restaurant to order some food. And uh, I say to the guy, I say, I would like to have, and before I even finish my sentence, he says, the chicken. <laughs> what the, what? I could not believe it. I could not believe that shit. This man was absolutely right. I said, how did he know? 
but I was going to get some chicken. I asked him, I said, how you know that? How'd you know I was going to get some chicken? He looked at me like I was crazy. Come on, buddy. Come on, buddy. Now, everybody knew as soon as you walked through the goddamn door, you're going to get some chicken. There's no secret down here that blacks and chickens are quite fond of one another. And then I finally understood what he was saying, and I got upset. I wasn't even mad. I was just upset. I wasn't ready to hear that shit. All these years, I thought I liked chicken because it was delicious. <laughs> Turns out I'm genetically predisposed to liking chicken. I said, why? I got no say in the man. I got ruined chicken for me. I'm scared to eat it in public. I don't know. I want somebody to see me and say something. You know what I mean? Like you be eating some chicken. Look at him. He loves it. Just like it said in the encyclopedia. Look how happy he looks. That's the thing, there's so many stuff. Okay. So this is a sketch from Dave Chappelle called The Chicken, which is uh, obvious, I think. Yeah. And um, what I like about it is uh, that he kind of complicates uh, several issues relating to stereotypes and racism. Um, and somehow we also ended up with these type of uh, stereotypes in uh, Europe or in the Netherlands as well. Also through these entertain through this like dissemination of entertainment from the US, but I guess also like for different reasons. But I kind of like the way it also, in, to me at least, like the functions as a, maybe a metaphor, or maybe even just like something that would happen in the art world as well. That uh, if a person of color like enters a museum and then stamp welcomes them like, and enthusiasm and uh, because of like it's exceptional that like a person of color is like in a in a museum space or in like an like, art space and uh but it kind of relates to this sense of belonging i think and also like if you belong somewhere you could perceive to belong somewhere and also in the same way like these curators are thinking uh, from like a, let's say in a universal standpoint and the idea of universality in which whiteness is centralized by people who consider themselves white uh, but this also includes like the kind of and objectivity, the quality and arts autonomy and um, let's say the non-politics of art and neutral neutrality in, ge uh, in general of a white group and choice institutions make, which tend to include erasure and exclusion and politics of presence. But in the same way, like uh, these type of institutions, um, like in the last half year, I've like, told about like how they are uh, in solidarity with uh, Black Lives Matter and um, like with different types of like presence of blackness and they want to change. And I still have to think about like how some of these exhibitions cannot think or most of these exhibitions actually cannot think about these uh, beyond these stereotypes that actually Chappelle is also addressing. So when like, uh, Kind of thinking about like a, a black visitor like the way Chappelle is uh, uh, visiting a restaurant rather than tell like uh, what, do, what, what would you like and then uh, if you say uh, Arthur Jaffa and then they're like ah of course like I knew that like you know and or Khalil Joseph and as a matter of fact um, there might have been moments that like also for me personally like that might have been true that I would like to see like maybe only the first Arthur Jaffa movie film or like a Khalil Joseph exhibition but in the same way uh, Chappelle also loves more than only chicken probably and these stereotypes are kind of still prevailing and see and it might be um, because of their works are really good sometimes and um, I will, there's also this thing that um, American culture uh, prevails in the sense that in Europe like a lot of um, curators look there but don't look in their own backyard let's say uh, for me personally for example if you talk about artists of color I would also like to see some people who live in London, uh, in 
in Amsterdam or people from Suriname, Brazil, maybe Curaçao, London, or even Rotterdam. Um, and some are black, others are of color, others are uh, maybe quite white. But maybe this, these stereotypical ways of curating also is uh, comes from this um, position that someone is ringing the bell. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, comes from this position that uh, until I think quite recent, uh, many white curators were themselves mainly interested in white uh, artists and then also thinking that black people only are interested in black people. And that's kind of what I like about the, the Chappelle that he's complicating that position. And um, the problem I think at this point is that now people are forced, uh, people who've been working in the institution for a while are forced uh, through funding measures or it's a social pressure or like societal pressure. Uh, they have to switch. Um, and then they make like the most shallow and obvious and basic uh, choices. And because their ideas about blackness are kind of uh, limited. Um, and then making uh, group shows with only black people as if they're not part of like a broader uh, discourse or like of a broader group of people or like how they would be able to fit in uh, team shows. And yeah, like this could be a lot of things, like a lot of reasons I've pointed out a few, I think. But I think mainly it's like a lack of imagination and a lack of knowledge, like how many of these people actually grew up amongst people of color and how do they know like, that, that people of color are more than just a skin and something to be uh, served in that sense. But then how they could also be actual real people with broad interest and, and knowledge and just not be, let's say, people who own, like, like more than a chicken. And let's see where I'm heading. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's uh, this lack of imagination that's kind of important here. And I've been writing about that a few times over the last half a year and also before, of course, but now it's been uh, featured a bit more widely. And this, uh, so I've been also pointing out this lack of imagination uh, that puts white middle aged men in a position of power, for example, or like uh, how people of color are mainly uh, when they have a museum, when they even have a museum job that they're mainly at the RCMC and not necessarily in other museums, although that changed this year, very recent. But I, I kind of find those uh, mechanisms interesting. And also how it's me who has to point it out and like several people around me as well, of course, like certain activists who have been done really important work and also like uh, uh, events like this. But at the same time, it's not the people in, that work in the museums themselves who are able to uh, do that. And I think aside from like the lack of um, imagination that I just uh, pointed out, I think it's also a lack of responsibility um, because they're not taking a responsibility of embodying an institution, being like inside an institution and knowing that your individual preferences and choices um, are considered like of value from the outside. <clears throat> like I'm, of course, in a way like um, present in the arts and in that sense have like a bit more uh, view and like uh, in the, in the, uh, on the backside of maybe institutions or the inside, but like, like regular visitors might not have that and just consider this idea of the museum like a, a body of something you can follow and that's like an objective kind of idea of what, what, whatever, um, um, whatever they produce is like quality. And I had to think about this uh, quote by Darby English and Charlotte Barat, who write, write in among others, Blackness at MoMA into that, from 2019, that by their very nature, art museums are selective, judging some work better than other work for a variety of reasons. Two, they are necessarily institutional, which lends all the adjustment of power of a decree. But at the end of the day, regardless of the power and influence they claim to or acquire, art museums are human systems, unstable, grounded in bias, habitual, and difficult to modify. And I think it's especially this, not actually this entire quote, but especially this last part, that is difficult to modify because these days people have been speaking about change a lot and uh, how they're in solidarity with uh, people of color, but who's really in favor of change if the change means that uh, you might have to leave yourself because that's like, the real change because you've been doing you've been you've been somewhere and you've been in this position and maybe it's time to if, if change is going to happen then 
that's the change. And how many people are really in favor of that? And I think that's kind of the essence of this contemporary debate in combination with um, the, the, yeah, the difficulty of mod modifying these structures. And let's see. Mm. And also I'd like to um, maybe have some more knowledge of what uh, of color means or like the ranges black black of color um, indigenous how like these term this terminology is used a lot but at the same time like in in the Netherlands for example it's never gone beyond Surinamese people and especially like uh, the Creole or Maroon people of, of Suriname so like the Afro Surinamese people well Suriname has also like Hindustani people uh, people that relate to Yava Chinese um, Jewish um, and then in the Netherlands itself like it broadens like Antillian with dif the different islands and the continent and then people don't really see like uh, the differences between all these different types of black let's say it's just like one it's, it's the other and the same goes for Moroccan and South African people or like people uh, from the Middle East Turkey like in Asia like you could go on with that and um, I think the problem there is that as long as whiteness is considered an inherent fact and not an encompassing measurement of everything else, the all controlling neutral referee who decides when and who can appear on their stage, in what form to perform a low paid brief dance, it's impossible to speak of real um, change or inclusivity or diversity um, or decolonization for whatever term you want to use these days, uh, as because they're used like all in the same realm. And it's just a few um, tolerated deviations from the white standard. And then I have to think about these open calls for like curators and then they want something, someone of color, but then, you know, you have like all these people who uh, are in a museum and they're, let's say 95%, uh, if not 99% white. And then there's this one position for like a person of color. And then you have like all the different types of colors that uh, I just mentioned and then, that's that only position and then you kind of kind of divide and conquer. And I'm wondering if like uh, Black Lives Matter really, these like if people really want to be in solidarity, I'm wondering like how many Black lives really matter as in how many Black lives have been, have they been supporting in their livelihood and in their lives and also in their art, like let's say in their artistry as well. So like how many people are really able to eat and live from like uh, the solidarity that's uh, been, uh, um, been, been <laughs> disseminated let's say and i kind of want to end with this quote of uh, shabazz palaces which is uh, if you talk about it it's a show but if you move about it it's a go and i think that's what i wanted to say as a start thanks hey um <clears throat> start um thanks vincent um, I, I should say to everybody online that you can always put your questions in into the chat and these questions will be either answered or filtered. And uh, thanks Vincent for also, you know, reminding me, reminding us that we continue to live in a certain, in this precarious moment with COVID-19. So it, it is, it is this complex moment of precarity and what that means for, 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 for for us all. And in this instance, you, you made the comment, how many black lives matter? And you tied that not necessarily only to a, a, a theoretical question, but you tied it to, um, to uh, a more materialist question, which is how many matter to live, to eat, to have a livelihood, which is um, in, in a sense, um, um, a question about job security, jobs, availability of places that, that those are the questions you, you want to you, you're trying to attend to i want to ask you one opening question which is since you've been doing this for so long i'm going back to other question but you've you've mentioned that you've been talking about this especially in relationship to art for so long um a kind of stupid question is are you ready to give up on the institution and if so if not where do you think we need to be to do to go 
Are you ready to give up? On the ones that exist, I think I kind of gave up over the last months. Um, while I like, I deeply love museums and art spaces and um, it's just the way like they absorb critique. They're able to like, their voice is always louder than mine. Um, as someone recently said, like, um, your letter is like in the in the newspaper this week and next week is business as usual. And I think that person was kind of right. Um, because I don't know like um, how, how much support also you, you would get from like, um, in, like the institutions themselves, like the people who are in there, because I can talk about the institution, but it's like it's, it's individuals. Uh, so on certain institutions, I have definitely given up and I don't even want to mention their names anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. Just not to give them that credit for like existing. But I'm also hoping that, for example, I could provide an alternative to uh, the artists who have to, who are like, have to go there. Like I'm kind of, I'm a writer, freelance curator, or whatever you want, like whatever I'm doing, all these different things. And I don't necessarily need like that platform of, of an institution. I do in a certain way, but at the same point, I can kind of pivot away also if I don't like it. But then I think for artists it's even more precarious because if you want to show your work, you need these spaces. So like something I've been thinking about for a while, but it's been become louder that maybe like an own institution would be nice. Um, and in that sense, you also can provide an alternative to people who don't want to work, actually don't want to work with these institutions, but um, kind of have to. And maybe it's the same for myself, but I think for uh, many artists, it's also the case. Yeah, but but in a in a certain sense, and I I I, I this is a critique that you hear. Eh? Um, one of part of the critique is also the the question that an institute. So you're basically saying institutions cannot be trusted because you know the letter comes out, the response happens, and then tomorrow it you go back to what you were doing before. So basically, in in a sense, you're saying that nothing changes. But 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 I want you also say on the other hand that these institutional structures are so powerful so strong our institution is is a is a big strong institution in its in its in what it can do what it can say in the resources if you were to give up to start your own institution doesn't that also leave in place that unchangingness doesn't it also because if you say that those institutions are are doing violence then what you do is to leave violence in place How do we balance that? I hope that like at a certain like in a certain way by giving a good example, yeah. they will lead. Uh, they will follow, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think it's like there's a certain value in within these institutions, like as a like beyond real estate talking about material, but also just like the collections. And even though I'm probably most of the time not even um, think like part of those collections and the way they've been like collected, like uh, mm. in, I'm talking about the art context. I don't want yeah. to go into the restitution <laughs> issues here, <laughs> <All right, yeah. laughs> for sure. Um, but I mean, like those those collections, they have a certain value, and there there's like a certain uh, knowledge there, and like in like and there's interesting objects. And in that sense, I think there's value in that part. But then I think the way they are run, uh, they're being run at this point, I think needs to change a lot. Like, I don't think, like I was just, had had this talk with the cultural program of the Apple and they said like, oh, we, we came to this position. Like I was kind of explaining how the Dutch, you know, function and with all the fun funding and all those mechanisms. And then the, these museums really remind me of like kind of how the government functions. And most of these museums, of course, were like governmental till not even that long ago. And so you have this like director who's just a hat on top, who's mostly talking. And then there's this, all these anonymous bodies that are floating or like sitting probably uh, inside who, who are doing work. And then the, the hat might change. 
but then these structures remain the same. And that's kind of how the ministries in the Netherlands work. Nobody knows who's like the, who's in the ministry working, but you know who the minister is. And I think like these type of things, like also to create that responsibility of an individual being visible as making these choices. And that, um, and then, you know, like if you're visible, you can be held accountable and you have to be, you have to be responsible because people can see you. And now most of these things, like how these collections are being formed and uh, what is being bought or which, how these decisions are being made for the shows, like these, they don't have to like, uh, tell anyone like maybe if you like really look really well you would know these people but like even on most of the website like maybe five years ago still it was like pictures of every person who would work at a certain museum these days it's it's not really the case like uh, many museums they they raise that and i think these responsibilities need to come up in that sense and in that way um i think the way a museum museum functions could change also and uh, in that sense, like the violence should be undone by like actually addressing these people, making them responsible for their acts. And then also putting like consequences to that because that's kind of something that's been lacking because they're right. just absorbing. I mean, you raised a lot of things and we're going to come back to it. You raised the, in, the question of why, why is it that internal to the institution these questions are not asked? Um, so, um, so why people inside the museum don't ask the question about for example, as you so put it, uh, moving beyond the stereotyped understanding of what blackness could be. But you also raised the question of, which is what you're raising now, uh, your fourth point was um, the question of the humanness of institutions, right? That despite we, that we think that um, institutions and it's racializing, institutionalizing of, of racism is an institutional thing, there is also people in it and in that humanness is a certain set of accountability and what is at stake in that humanness as well. I want to come back to those points in the discussion, but thank you for this opening, the kind of opening foil um, for, and especially this idea of uh, 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 thinking through what the race person is in racism, blackness as a whole, and what is at stake in that. So we'll come back to you. Thank you, Vincent. And we're going to move now to, 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 to Noza, um, Noza Imagodo. And Noza Imagodo is a um, doctoral candidate at the University of Essex in the sociology department. His research assesses the perspective of black British activists to take differing stance on as to why institutional racism persists and who employ varying strategies campaigning tirelessly in deliberating and putting into action ways in which racism can be eradicated in Britain. Having moved from political politics to sociology, his academic background includes politics, history, international studies, and re religious studies. No, sir, welcome. I've heard a lot about I... you and we've never met, so. <laughs> no, can you hear me actually? I hear you very well, we hear okay, you very well. Okay, because I'm using so... a headphone, so yeah. All right, um, please um, be begin with your first points and then we'll come back to a conversation after is that right okay yeah great um well i want to say thank you wayne and your team for um, inviting me to be part of this um, panel and also i want to say thanks to um, vincent for such a um, wonderful um, opening statement especially about the part of um, we need a deeper understanding of what it means to be um, black i think this is something i've often argued in my research but just to um, speed up a little bit i'm going to do my best to keep it quite short and also crisp and also i want to start with a few disclaimer uh, well people should already forgive me if my opinions are not so um, filtered and also um, for words that people might find a little bit um, offensive i think in relation to museums and what museums can do to regain the trust of some people or many people. I think it's, it's important for us, to, for me to start with uh, an historical background so that we can better understand and um, contextualize the um, problem at hand or the discussion, whatever we choose to um, call it. So in 1995, there was a campaign to bring back um, the um, Hotel to Venus. Uh, for the sake of sort of understanding who this attend to Venus is, I'm going to share my screen and so this, this is what um, um, she looked like and um, 
in the in 1995, this campaign started to bring back the remains of um, to repatriate the remains of this um, Corsan woman who was held at the Museum de l'Homme in Paris. So the South African government um, wanted her back so they could give her a humane burial. The one, yeah, I guess French people at the time could not afford to give to her. But of course, this um, ignited a de um, political debate between the um, French and South African governments, and to the extent that uh, President Mandela, at the time, uh, himself wrote personal requests on the behalf of uh, South African people to French President uh, Francois Mitterrand, who was president in 1995, and then when he left power. Uh, and also, he wrote another letter to um, Jacques Chirac, who became, uh, who succeeded uh, Mitterrand. Well, it's important to know that this request took um, seven years um, to fulfill. But well, this woman in question is today known as um, Sarah Batman. Obviously, it's a very there is a Dutch connection there, given the name. But well, I want to speak a little bit about um, Batman's um, condition. Well, she arrived in London first, not uh, in France, in 1810, and she was put on display to be gazed, to be gazed at because of her uh, um, protruding um, buttocks. Shortly after Batman's arrival in London, members of the public were invited to view, view her for two shillings. She wore a dress that resembled her complexion and clothes so tight so as to make her shapes, breasts and buttocks as visible as if she was naked, essentially to give her the appearance of being um, undressed. The show took place upon a stage two feet high along which she was held um, she was held and led by her keeper and exhibited like a white beast, being obliged to walk, stand, or sit as he ordered. One Charles uh, Matthews at the time, who was a comedian, upon visiting Batman, said he found her surrounded, um, surrounded by many people, some females. One pinched her, one gentleman poked her with his cane, one lady um, employed a parasol to ascertain that all, as she put it, was natural. Barman bore this humane gaze with solemn indifference, except upon some provocation when she resented the brutality. On this occasion, it took all the authority of the keeper to subdue her resentment. Um, when London was done with Batman, she was moved to Paris to experience the same um, humiliation. However, Batman died in Paris in 1815, and after which uh, janitor stayed on display throughout the 20th century until she was brought back to South Africa in 2002. I'm going to stop sharing um, the image and I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, my personal experience. Just to fast forward a little bit, about a month ago, I was in the Reich uh, Museum and for the first time I went to the top floor, something I consider an atelier, but not sure. There you find uh, modern, hi modern history and exhibitions such as airplanes and so forth. And there was a short video and burst of, in of the Indonesian struggle for independence and also a small exhibition about the Holocaust. Well, I quickly surmised that these exhibitions uh, represented Dutch history with the other non-white Dutch people, but there, was no, there were no exhibitions about um, people of African descent. I mean, I wonder why, and I don't think we should ponder um, too much about um, the reason for that. Um, the point I give this um, antecedents, this um, historical background and also about my experiences that for many black people, a museum can easily be a place that indirectly or directly showcases the violence against black people and other racialized body. Also a place where stories of black people are not worth telling just like I felt, hence the mistrust. So the question at hand, which I think we should quickly go back to is, what can museums do to regain um, their trust? I mean, being an academic myself and also taking a lot of ideas from my research, I think the solution is um, decolonization. Yeah, it does seem like a buzzword and um, an academic jargon and a concept that can only take place within the university and educational sector. But I sincerely believe and I argue that um, every public and private institutions can benefit from um, decolonization. But how do you decolonize a museum since that have been existing since the 1800s? Um, just stealing a little bit because this is what we do in academia. We still we read, we steal ideas, and we modify them and make them as. So this is what I've done with um, Stephen Small's um, decolonial processes. I Small gave um, four decolonial processes. I think for an institution like museums, I think I want to shorten it down to three decolonial processes. Um, the first one is content. For a place such as museum, I think it is important to be on 
I think the, the, what is important to do is that honesty is the best policy. Museums have to be honest. For example, the Dutch Golden Age. For a lot of white Dutch people, it might be a period of prosperity and so forth, but for many non-white people, it's a reminder of slavery, plundering, and colonialism. This is where you hear the ho, 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 ho. I'm not saying that history should be erased. I'm just saying, be honest. There are always two sides to, to a story. So where is the other half? And within the context of uh, within the context of content as a decolonial de process, I think there are other aspects, and one aspect also is repre uh, representation. Museums, especially in Western society, can sometimes for racialized people feel like a place or a house where images and ideas of white supremacy are exhibited, whether consciously or, sub or subconsciously. I, I argue that this change is possible and um, it should change. For example, I visited the Bode Museum last year in Berlin, where there was an exhibition titled Beyond Compare. Essentially, they juxtaposed some aspects of European art and African art that developed roughly around the same time. Being a very critical person like my, uh, myself, as a lot of people will tell you, I didn't get this feeling that one, one art was made to feel superior to the other. In fact, I felt proud that um, for the very first time in a very long time, especially in a country like Germany and in Berlin, African art was um, being appreciated. But just moving on a little bit, um, in this decolonial process, I argue again that another step museums can take is staffing. It's not enough that a museum um, staff members are uh, woke or super libra, I can quote Baldwin, Fanon, Bell Hooks, and um, great intellectual. Uh, great black intellectual. Factually, I think quoting these people in a white space where there are no other racialized people, I don't like to use the word people of color because it makes it seem like the original color is white and every other person has a very white color. So I like to use the word white and non-white or racialized people. So I think white people who quote these great black artists in a modern day in a white space um, practice what I call theft and modern day plundering. Uh, the last aspect of this decolonial process I would argue is access and opportunities through resources. So resources, access and opportunities should be, should be given to not just educated black people and other racialized people, but also for the layman. But what is important to mention is that these, ste these steps can happen one after the other. They don't have to happen, happen um, the way I've listed them, they can come before the other and they can happen side by side. By way of conclusion, I think um, the day of making excuses are literally over. You have no excuse anymore. Institution needs to acknowledge um, the wrongs that they've done or they are doing right now. And yes, one might say, yes, it's a long time ago that these wrongs were done. Yes, it's a long time ago for, for, for many white people who still enjoy benefits today, but for a lot of black people, given the situation, a lot of black people find themselves, it's not such a long time ago. And secondly, I think what is also important is listening. You cannot have a conversation if someone is listening and always interrupting you. You might learn a thing, of, a thing or two. So I think it's important for institutions, especially the white people in these institutions to listen. And um, lastly, and as I would like to say, and finally, is that institutions should put their money where their mouth is. Yeah, I think I'm going to um, stop here. Um, I, thank you, thank you, Nosa. Um, um, uh, when, when you gave your, your preamble to say that you're going to say something bad, I was expecting something bad. So, uh, no, you hadn't said, oh, yeah? anything, no, you hadn't said anything bad. And, 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 no, being in the classroom, you always have to say a lot of disclaimers. Okay, good, to, good, 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 good. Thank you. People. <laughs> no, but I, I want to, I, want to um, I mean, it's nice that you also give these kind of four steps to decolonization. To be honest with you, I have always pushed pushed against these kind of um, bullet points for decolonization because it, 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 it seems too easy. But I, I want to come to, um, there are two really important points and I, I think that you, you touch on something that's really sensitive, which is going to be my sixth, second question. In, my first question is in your experience though, 
as yourself an academic and perhaps an activist in, 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 in I don't know how you want to call yourself, but as an activist, scholar activist scholar yeah. activist that is all right what <laughs> what kind of collaborative possibilities do you think museums can create that is non-violent that does not reproduce racial violence how do you translate these four points to a collaborative framework that isn't reproducing racial violence well i think um it should be wider participation i think um i think um when you want to when you have a museum you should it should be representative of the society you live in i think um activists scholars um <coughs> academics um a lot of black people from different walks of life should participate in this collaboration you know i think you should give agency to a lot of people you haven't given agency to you know i think you should put a lot of things into context i think this is one way to collaborate without having to repeat violence without having to reiterate the violence that has been going on um, for such a long time but museums there, there are many institutions who would, would think that they've been doing that for a while they've been think that they're because in especially in um and i'm cautious to say it but within ethnographic museums museums where we work there is a long history of this idea of collaboration, of participation, I mean, um, of sharing authority. These have become kind of buzzwords in our, 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 our vocabulary. Yet you see that um, recent, the recent, um, mobil the very recent anti-racist mobilization have been calling into questions even these earlier acts of, of collaborative practice. So is it only about participation or is there a way that we can structure participation that, 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 that pushes towards more equity? I think the problem um, with a lot of institutions is that um, the steps they take are very slow, very mm -hmm. snail-like. You know, they do something really little and they say, oh, I've done, I've done this thing, you know? But, they're not listening to the people that are saying, we want this, we want that. You're not taking those things into account. You're not listening properly. They, they, they just, I would say, put plaster on a wound and then the injury sipping pours from another side, you know? So I think the problem is that they're, they're doing things half measured. My mom always say, what doing is well, what, what's doing is what doing well. So why don't you go all the way, go the, all the, nine yards instead of going one yard, you know? So I think the problem, the discontent still is that you think you're doing something, but you're not listening to the public and the demands and what they want and what is important. So I think the problem there is, yeah, not listening properly. They hear, but they don't listen. But, and I think it's, yeah, um, okay. yeah the, the change is a little bit half measured, you know? Like, oh, let's just, let's just do this. Let's just, you know, um, give them crumbles and stuff like that. So I think this is this is the problem in my opinion. All right, I mean, I like that in a, in a funny way, it's one of the things that we've been interested in is, is in this um, collaboration as listening. And what does it mean to be quiet, to, to be questioning and listening and not necessarily to always have the answer. Um, it is how we have thought about what decolonization could mean as well within the context of our museum. Um, but it is still something that is a, a difficult thing. Now, the, the, you put your finger on a very sore point. When you, know. Yeah, no, when you say the woke people who keep quoting Audre Lorde, quoting James um, Baldwin or Glisson or Césaire or Fanon, um, why is that, is that the feeling that you, in your own research, you see that emerging that the, that institutions are doing the quotes but not the work. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that um, in my experience and based on my research, um, um, yeah, non-liberal white people used to be the problem. I argue, and I would keep on arguing, and a lot of people will agree with me that white liberals today are the problem. First of all, they don't listen and they read. Baldwin and Fanon, and they think they're work. They think they can do the job. They think that just being work is enough. And when you try to have a conversation, they, they say, oh yeah, but 
but but I'm nice, I'm good, you know. But what they're not doing is that they're not listening. So I think it's a problem because um yeah, it's it's no different. It's it's no different from plundering the ideas of these people mm. and at the same time not creating opportunity and access to where this um, 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 knowledge comes from. But so, so what you're saying... Did I answer the question? Yeah, yeah, no, you answered the question. Because what you're saying is that you're not suggesting that the ideas of, 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 of um, intellectuals of color or black intellectuals or what, how you name it, non-white intellectuals, should not be mobilized in the museum. You're rather saying it cannot be so that it becomes mobilized without any form of access any form of change in the institution yes. that it is it is mobilized to Absolutely. get the museum better but not necessarily giving changing the system itself all right no sir thank you yeah that's pretty much what i'm saying all right brilliant i'm coming back to you i want to go next to charles esh um who will be our our third speaker um charles is um the director of the von Abel museum in Eindhoven a professor of contemporary arts and creating at the Saint, um, Central St. Martin at the UAL London and co-director uh, of the After All Journal and Books. He teaches on exhibition studies, at, um, um, masters in res and course at, at C CSM and at Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht. Charles is also someone who has been in, in the museum world in the Netherlands anyway the Van Abba and, and, and Charles, um, they've been involved a lot in trying to think through that really complex relationship between inclusion, diversity, and questions surrounding um, 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 art and art practice. What forms of new institutionality, I would want to suggest, um, that art institutions can create in terms of their public role. Charles, over to you. Um, um, you have a an opening foil um, that you can speak to, and then we can come back to a, a question or two. Yes, um, I'll, I'll do my best, Wayne, and thanks very much for uh, inviting me to talk here. Um, and also thanks to Nossa and to, to Vincent for the persuasive presentations they made. Um, I have to say, Wayne introduced us all as outsiders, and I feel um, that I'm a fraud in that uh, in that uh, regard because I'm very much, I think, an insider within institutions. Um, but nevertheless, and I, I'd be happy to talk about the Van Abbe Museum specifically, and we'll try to mention that. But I thought in the introductory comments, I would um, say a couple of things that are, are maybe trying to take account of the changes which have happened in the most recent period. And I have really three, I suppose, main points that I'd like to make. The first one is that. Um, uh, I think there is a certain um, positiveness that we can take out of um, having this conversation now in the Netherlands. And I do that because, um, uh, you know, having worked at the Van Avon Museum for 15 years, um, I've also um, uh, seen a situation where these kind of conversations could not have happened, even in the relatively recent past, even a few years ago. Um, uh, you know, we can we can cite examples of the way that uh, a modern narrative, uh, a modern art narrative, certainly, um, was something that just was felt to be irrelevant to the kind of conversations that we're having now. And I do think that is changing. I think that. Um, what we call communities of color or Afro-Dutch or, 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 or black or migrant communities um, are, have fought to find a platform in which uh, they are able to speak from in a way that they weren't in the, in the recent past. And I think that's an encouragement. I think that shows that something is changing. Now I appreciate, as Wayne said, that people are willing to give up or wanting to give up at the moment and the change has been exhausting and that also the changes which that has produced have often been rhetorical rather than structural. So I understand why the energy would come to say, actually, this is no good. As Vincent said, he's given up on the Van Abbe Museum or, or other institutions that they're simply pointless to engage with. I do understand that. However, I do think it's worthwhile to, to take on board um, the, the changes that have shifted, say, over a period of 10 years. And I think often, and very rightly, I think, there's a frustration and a demand uh, for urgency, which is not mirrored by the institutions themselves, um, but that the institutions are in a very slow way, I mean, some of them at least, are, are changing. And I think, you know, it's, it's worthwhile pausing for a moment when we talk about this and reflect on the last few cultural appoint appointments in the Netherlands, uh, and to be uh, aware that there is a shift from even two years ago 
in those appointments. And I think that's uh, that's something that we um, we should also take stock of in this process, not in a sense to defeat ourselves through, through feeling that everything remains the same always. Um, these steps are micro steps, and I'll come back to this micro level uh, in a minute, but these steps are certainly micro steps and they're not adequate and they're not enough. But if we say that absolutely zero has changed and nothing has happened, I think we've placed ourselves in danger, and maybe this is from an insider point of view, we place ourselves in the danger of simply feeling as though it's impossible uh, ever to address these issues. Um, so, you know, in, amidst all the darkness of, uh, of Trump and, and uh, Erdogan and, and, uh, and Modi and Johnston and things like this, uh, amid all that darkness of a, of a, you know, of a white political backlash and a, a, a backlash of, of, uh, of forces of, uh, of, um, of uh, authoritarianism, we could say fascism, um, amidst that there's also change happening at other levels. And I think, you know, the, 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 the battle that's to come in a way, and uh, Yanis Varoufakis recently said that we're around in 1939 at the moment, if we want to make some comparison uh, with the 20th century and when it's history, that 2008 was 1929, that we're, we've reached around 2000, we've, in 2020, we've reached 1939 with this, uh, this uh, pandemic being uh, a kind of critical moment. Um, and I say also we will, if that's true, if that's, if that's something that we even accept, um, there is a possibility that we reach 1945. And we reach a moment where things down many mistakes were made in 1945 and 1945 was the start of the invasion of indonesia so we don't need to to uh, dramatize it but it was also the defeat of fascism and it was also a defeat in a moment where something better than fascism was put on the table at least within uh, uh within the european context and eventually within the colonial context um so there is sort of a, you know, a, a note of positivity amongst the, amongst the gloom, which I do, as I say, appreciate and understand and certainly don't want to um, uh, downplay in any way. Um, the second point would be to look at, um, at the question of the institution itself and the way that we use the word, and maybe to understand um, both where our institutions as museums come from, but also how institutions might change. And obviously, I'm not going to um, recite sort of Durkheim uh, social theory in here, but nevertheless, it's useful to be aware of what the sociological understanding of institutions are when we use the word, I think. Um, but firstly, to say that museums, such as the one that Wayne works in or the one that I work in, both of them, were developed and constructed by a racist society. There is no getting away from the fact that in the DNA encoded, if you like, in our bricks and mortar are patterns of colonization and modernization. And I think, you know, decoloniality teaches us that the colonial and the modern are inseparable. That the one is dependent on the other. And the colonial is impossible without the modern, just as the modern is impossible without the colonial. That, that, this, that this link is, is uh, you know, is forged in our institutions. And we can even see it um, very, uh, you know, appropriately, I think, nicely um, in, in the collections and, the, and, the, and the, the way that our collections, the Van Abbe Museum and the, the National Museum of uh, World Cultures, that those, uh, that those collections are divided yeah? because they represent precisely this, this crack between modernity and coloniality, between the colonial and the modern. And the fact that that uh, that um, you know we are showing a small element of the collection uh, from the um, from the uh, World Cultures Museum in our museum, and I hope we will do further, is I think a way of both pointing out that crack, understanding that it's an imposition upon a set of objects, just as Nossa was saying about um, the presentation in in Germany, that these processes of of bringing those of healing. That, that, that division, that crack that was forced in which certain objects were, were ascribed to the modern art museum or even the Western art museum historically, and certain objects were ascribed to the ethnographic museum for no better reason than that people saw these as two incompatible elements. Um, that, that, that healing, that crack is actually something um, which the institutions can do. I think also we have to understand that being based on this colonization, modernization discourse, um, that was also used as a, as a social justification, as an, an, in, in, an intellectual infrastructure to build white superiority. So, the, you know, our institutions are encoded with these, with, these, uh, with these horrific pasts, with these violent pasts, and we have to deal with them. Um, it's no good saying that we can simply throw these, these uh, historic positions off, that we can remake ourselves. We have to go through the darkness of understanding, acknowledging and recognizing what the history of modernity, coloniality or coloniality, modernity, I should say, coloniality, modernity actually is. And, and um, not only trying to heal or to plaster over these, but actually see what we can do. Now, 
I would say also that in the contemporary times or in the times say of the last 30 years, so post 1989, we have to deal also with another um, uh, uh, Umization, I suppose we could say, alongside colonialization and modernization, another act of of, uh, of extraction, another act of of uh, imposition of uh, European uh, authority and power, and that is globalization and its political uh, um, sister uh, neoliberalism. Um, now, actually, through globalization and neoliberalism, which has also enormously affected, I think, museums. Um, we can we might suggest that the, the the kinds of institutions that we're talking about, the National Museum of World Cultures or, or Van Abbe Museum or other institutions, um, have um, become um, more precarious, maybe less necessary than we assume them to be. That actually, in building a nation state, a Rijksmuseum is necessary. A lot of the justification for something like the Rijksmuseum has become, and that's also from internal arguments, um, a tourist attraction, a way of economic development. And that's because of globalization, neoliberalism, and those discourses, which, which are very much connected to colonialization and modernization. It's not separate, but it's another form of that. And that form of it has also shifted the position of the institution. So when we talk about the institution as being key to these discourses, I think they're key in a different way than they were before. Um, and that often means, or has meant until the pandemic, certainly, that um, there's a centralization of power in certain uh, key modern or, or historical institutions in capitals, a lot of the time in Western Europe. And that has also um, had uh, enormous consequences, I think. Um, so that's really for, for the institution. And what I would like to say as my final point is, is this, this, this idea of giving up on institutions. I'm obviously sympathetic to it. You know, I go back and think of um, Malevich um, uh, asking to burn the Hermitage and burn all the museums from Tsarist Russia in the beginnings of the revolution. But I still think that we, we should be, we should see the possibility that they weren't burned um, as also a possibility to rewrite those histories. Um, and I think that if, if, you, if we were to think what should change in the museum if there is possibility then that change um, is is of course to some extent individually driven but it's also driven by collectivities i think one of the theories of the institution that might be useful is a molecular theory one where there is a certain movement within the molecule but the molecule is also dependent for its form and its structure on other molecules elsewhere so this is somewhere between a kind of atomistic neoliberal desire in which everything is individually determined and something which is uh, you know more holistic or determinist um that sort of molecular molecular theory of institutions i think is one that's that's useful for us to apply in thinking what our individual agency as a director or as a, an activist from outside side um, is but also how we can together how 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 um, a director in a museum is dependent upon actions outside I think you can see that for instance in the change of name of, uh, of the the um, Melly uh, cultural cultural center or art center as I think it would be called um, which uh, you know went through a necessary process of uh, of uh, community involvement of of uh, the the art community in Rotterdam and I think also outside of it actually contributing to that change. Uh, I don't think it would have been effective if it had simply been dictated by a director, but it meant that the that the listening and caring for what that community thought was absolutely crucial to that process. And you know maybe the process went on too long. We could argue about that, but nevertheless the fact that it was a collective process I think is a good example of the way that change is produced if name if the name change is sufficient and i think that would be also a very good question but nevertheless that change is produced through collective action and that we support and are dependent on each other and what i would say um so sort of really in conclusion is, is what do we need to do if we're not going to give up on institutions but we're going to try and and shift them i think that in you know one of the the key demands i think not only in institutions but but economically and and, and socially and politically, I think, is the demand for degrowth, which is a response not only to the climate emergency, um, but also, I think, to a, to a sense that, uh, that growth is only serving a very narrow range of interests and a very narrow um, part of the, the society. Um, and, you know, and you know, as a side point, I'm struck by the way that the, the new restitution policy uh, that Wayne was also involved in, which I think is uh, 
uh, you know, it's encouraging that that statement has been made. It, it, we need to see whether it will be adopted. But that new restitution policy would clearly be for the collections in museums, a wonderful opportunity to degrow. Um, and I think that modern art museums need to think about the same kinds of processes. Yeah, why is the modern archive so much held in Western Europe and North America when modernity, uh, al alongside coloniality, has had such an impact? Shouldn't that that archive be be, be spread wider, and shouldn't it be unpicked? And attacked and re redrawn um, in, in, in many different ways in many different places. Um, I think also that's important along with the with degrowth to, to really focus on uh, overwriting and changing the canon and that there I speak more about the modern art movement we've been trying to do that in terms of explaining the the, the problematics of modern art as a concept within our own uh, exhibitions and our own collection but I think going for, further than that what I see in institutions like the Tate or Museum of Modern Art in, in New York is an idea of of, uh, of accretion yeah of growing the canon um, while never touching the core the core values of its center and I think those core values have to be re written if we're going to degrow rather than simply to grow um, you know museums have suffered enormously from um, real estate growth rather than intellectual growth in the last 30 years and I think that intellectual growth requires us probably to get smaller as well physically and but also for collections to get smaller and for those canons to be rewritten um, I think we also need to slow down in our production and I think part of that is also is, is you know when I talk about the institution as a collectivity, um, I think we also need to understand ourselves as part of an ecosystem in a more clear way and maybe to try and build the ecosystem that we want and what that means for an institution like the Van Abbey is I think to much more rely on production and ideas that come from outside as much as trying to be a sort of uh, you know independent entity which uh, provides so much you know museums have grown so much in their in their um, expectations of themselves in a way not necessarily in related to the expectations of a, uh, of, of a user group but more in the expectations of themselves and maybe that needs to change in, in looking to partnerships in looking to collaborations outside of itself in order to produce content and ideas which can come in. And finally, I think we need, you know, at, at, a, at a sort of fundamental level, maybe, um, to understand that what we can do as museums is working on this micro level, almost the micro histories of the objects, the narratives, the knowledge, the people um, who come into contact with our institutions, that how we can, I think, make persuasive arguments for change is by showing, you know, the sort of idea, the ideology of micro histories is to look at the marginalia in a way of, of history and to understand that if there is an exception, if there's an example of resistance to uh, colonial power, an example of resistance to, to the modern imposition of, of ideas of progress and growth, an example of resistance to racialization, that those are the things, those exceptions are the things that we maybe need to foreground uh, and need to focus on, grounded in some reality, of course, but something that we need to tell stories about that empower us for the future. And I think that the collections that we have, if we look at them from the micro historical point of view, um, uh, can, uh, can provide something of, of, of real value, particularly if we mix the collections which have been torn asunder by, by modernity uh, and coloniality. I think that's, that's me now. I hope that wasn't too long. Um. Well, it, funnily enough, I just got a, a, a beep which says Charles needs to stop. So yes, it was right at the end, Charles. May, thank you, Charles. I mean, I, I, there are many things that you said um, in this, and one of the things that I think one could hold on to, and I, I, I think I would articulate it otherwise, but you, you, you spoke about the positive of what has changed, right? Um, in our own work, what we try to suggest is if, if, you, if you need to understand what the battle needs to be, you, you actually need to know where you are in the battle, right? So you need to know what you've achieved, what has been taken away, what has moved before you can say you're going to fight. So you need to know where you are, what has been achieved. So, I mean, we agree on that, but there is a, a certain troubling question that comes in from outside that I can ask you because you still speak of the museums articulating with a collectivity in being part of a particular ecosystem, but in that the question is from many activists, but if the museum stays the same, because it's very internal structure is a structure of whiteness, what does that mean for its relationship to co collective? How is the museum internally changing through staffing, through whatever, so that it's, it, it does not maintain this notion, this, this framework of whiteness that collects to, connects to a connectivity 
of others outside? How are you changing internally? I think, I mean, I think that's certainly, you know, one of the key issues, and I think that is happening elsewhere. One of the key questions is staffing themselves and the fact that we would actually not, uh, uh, you know, look to um, uh, positively discriminate in, in all the jobs across the board, from the director um, to, to uh, everyone who works in the museum. It's clear that we need to do that. But I don't think it's only that. I mean, that's an, that's an important, but it's almost a given. Yeah, it's not something that we don't really need to, need to discuss very much or to feel very happy about. It's something that should be um, for the hand lichens, as you say it in Dutch. Um, uh, what actually needs to happen is that through that process, which is, I think, a process also of listening, and of caring about what you hear, so listening and caring have to go together, that you change the narratives, that we don't remain with a narrative inherited from the Museum of Modern Art in 1936, and then try to add lots of different little elements to it, which somehow then compensate. I think that that's right. That's not changing, at least in the modern art museum, the white narrative. What needs to change is that fundamental DNA, which the institution was born with. You know, our institution was born in 1936, the same time that Alfred Barr wrote that diagram of the isms from impressionism to geometric abstraction, which essentially was the blueprint that produced the institution and produced its collection. Now it's the blueprint that's the problem. And the question is, you, you changing that blueprint is obviously a process of time because we have these, these, these archives of artworks and, and information, um, which perhaps needs to be shared, needs to be sent elsewhere in part in order to create space. Um, but also that we need to tell different stories and telling those different stories requires a kind of listening and a kind of caring about what you hear that I think is, is, is building a confidence in those activists, as you say, to feel that their voices are not only heard by us, but that we no longer speak, yeah? that we don't interpret them and end up speaking for people, but we find mechanisms, and I think that's through constituency working, as we call it, but it's, it's really underdeveloped. Yeah? This, is, this is something that's at the, at the edge, I feel, of where, of where we are at the moment, that we develop mechanisms in which we, we leave the field to some extent. You know, as as to some museum professionals, but also as white people that 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 pretend to know things, yeah. And that, and at that moment, then I think you have to build confidence that 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 change is possible. And maybe it won't be, but the only way we can know if it really is is impossible, and that the institution does need burning down. And I don't rule that out as an option. Yeah. The only way that we can know that is actually to go through those processes of trying to build um, trust and listen to when it breaks down and why it breaks down. All right. Um, uh, there is a question from 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 outside, and then I move to to um, to our last speaker. Um, how do you reconcile this loyalty to institution with your call for the collective action? What is that action then striving for, if not for changing the very institution itself? Um, my question would would be: Could these developments giving up on existing institutions and changing institutions from within all be in uh, community work, not strengthen. Okay, let me skip that because that's complicated. <laughs> Do you think that the suggestion to rewrite the institution histories means that you sweep current issues under the rug? Is it not just uh, a modern colonial response? Do you not think that the museum space should actively exhibit the and confront racist issues rather than doing it in such that more intellectualized way? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a shame if we start thinking in these polarities, no? I think that we can exhibit the exhibit, we can address, we can, we can, we can discuss, we can think through in forums that the museum has as, at its, at its uh, availability. We can think through those on the basis of uh, the, the, the racist inheritance and the contemporary racism, which the museum embodies, which, the, which is written into its, into its bricks and mortar. Um, I think through rewriting the, 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 the canons of modernity, but also through having meetings about Svarta Piet, which is what we had some years ago. You know, and I don't think the one excludes the other. I think it's a shame if we think in terms of these po polarities. We can have those activist meetings. We can bring uh, um, artists in who are dealing very much with the contemporary violence of racism. And at the same time, we can rewrite those canons. Right. And so what you're, what you're suggesting here, actually, um, is, is, is to ask the question, how might we um, trace a, that longer history of racializing violence through the histories of the institution itself, 
through our collecting histories, through all of our histories. For example, us at the Tropo Museum, through our own very big role in physical anthropology and race science in the Netherlands. So that longer histories that tell the story of how we are implicated in the in the present. Okay, and thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Last yeah. point, quick, quick point, because yeah. I need to go to Simone. Yeah. All right, Charles, you, do you want to say one last thing or should I go to? No, I just said the one supports the other because yeah. if, we, yeah. if we can address that history, it also gives us a reason for talking about the present, but that's yeah. enough. All right, okay, thank you, Charles. And we now go to Simona. Um, and generally, um, we speak about somebody um, <coughs> not needing an introduction, but I won't say that. Um, she does. Um, Simona Zefa is an Amsterdam based writer, cultural programmer, and organizer whose work centers around representation, inclusivity, and importantly, around questions of justice, social justice. She focuses on Afri-centered perspective, decolonizing knowledge institutions, questions around digitality and the movement against the illegalization of the so-called undocumented members of the Afro-Dutch community. Artistically, her main interests are in films, literature and theater. She, um, we have uh, ongoing conversations all the time around this question of the literary imagination um, questions of um, collaborative future building. Um, Simona is in some ways a friend of ours, um, in many ways. <laughs> Welcome, Simona. I want you to oh. perhaps, um, um, I, I don't know if you want to do it as a presentation or you want to do it more as a reflection. Um, I'll come back to more pointed question, but as a reflection on on some of what it was mentioned before, but also how, how you see as somebody who invited us to, together with um, Hoda and, 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 and Teresa, invited us to think about decolonizing the museum several years ago, how you see this current moment in, re in relationship to questions of institutionality and a mm. certain ongoing racism. Well, I would like to share a few notes that I, uh, that I took uh, based on the invitation to this event. Yes. Uh, first of all, many thanks to you, Wayne and Amal for the invitation, and a big salute to Vincent, Nosa, and Charles for their, uh, for their statement. Um, two things that stood out to me were uh, the questions, what causes the Institute to be so stubborn when it comes to racialized exclusion, and how can they regain our trust? So I'd like to start with the first one, uh, because I think these structures or processes come from a very specific ideology that normalizes the idea that those who benefit from colonial mentalities and colonial structures must also benefit from the unpacking or destruction of these colonial mentalities and structures. Uh, I think it's telling that many of these institutions try to capitalize on the undoings and the unlearnings of their colonial behavior. Uh, I personally think that not every change needs to be sparked or needs to spark a string of press releases, events, temporary exhibitions, almost never permanent exhibitions. Uh, think tanks or a klangbord group, as you would say in Dutch. Uh, for me, it's difficult to put my trust in institutions that refuse the notion that the reward for doing the right thing and undoing the violence should be just that, uh, just being better. Uh, and better for all Black people and non-Black people of color. I think this is linking to what Nosa said earlier, but I'm uh, always keeping a close eye on how institutions interact with everydayness. Um, and for me, my focus, my main focus on the Afro-Dutch communities um, and it's, it's difficult to see how they engage uh, with the non-exceptional everydayness of Afro-Dutch communities. And I know this is something Amal also often talks about, um, but I like to look at how these institutions engage with Afro-Dutch people who live, move, imagine, and refuse in ways that these institutions can even imagine. Um, and this is what Vincent also addressed in his talk, like the assumptions of what we like, but also the assumptions of what we are drawn to, who draws us in uh, and who, who keeps us out basically. Um, and in this, I'd like to include a much felt irritation of how Afro-Dutch is often being used as synonymous to Afro-Caribbean and in particular Afro-Surinamese people. And I'm saying this as a Surinamese person also. Um, so I'm looking forward to unpacking what the sudden interest, quote unquote, in blackness would look like if you would ask different Afro-Dutch communities from the so-called Americas or from the African continent um, if they feel represented by these institutions, claim to be wanted to be more uh, inclusive. Um, 
And for example, I wonder if museums would also be interested in centering liberation movement that aren't yet on the mainstream radars of social justice. Um, and my last point is, I think when we're having these conversations, it often feels as if we're facing a bunch of variations on one question. Uh, and the question I'm being, can we, pretty please, come up with a structure that is truly decolonial, but still keeps these colonial hierarchies of humanity in the center of its comfort, relevance, and gains? Um, so I believe that the worry isn't so much about artists giving up, but the worry is about losing the grip of validation uh, and the monopoly of expertise. So another thing, and that's the final thing, um, I think that it's important that we are more specific. So what do institutions mean when they talk about artists giving up? Because I think the vast majority of the people that I either know personally or that I follow, they don't look as if they're giving up on art or on a togetherness with other artists, um, but they are giving up on like the mainstream museums, like the bigger museums, they are losing relevance. <clears throat> So you have this collective, and I think, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but it's Numbi Arts um, from the UK. And they just crowdfunded an initiative to start a Somali museum. So that means that and with crowdfunding, I mean like people donated their money because they had faith that this museum needs to happen. And I'm sure that if, I don't know, Gloria Becker and Ernestine Convalius and Alem Desta and Jan Frank and Omi Peter, if they would say, hey, we're gonna start a museum about uh, social justice movements in the Netherlands, I think people would have trust in that museum. Um, so what kind of museums do we talk about when we ask if, you know, if a museum should be abolished or if people are losing faith? Um, yeah, so those are my, those are my points. Uh, that's it. And I would like to discuss. Thank, thank you, Simona. Um, um, of course, this, this, we invite you all always for this very sharp, um, thinking about where 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 things become vague. So so what do we mean by the institution? What is the institution that we're talking about, for example? And 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 one of the things that I hear in your statement just now is is that a lot of the work to or no, let me say it another way. Is it that what you're saying is that a lot of the work that we're trying to do is not necessarily to attend to the cause of social justice? But to attend to the to, to the um, the re rehabilitation of the institution. Yeah. Is, yeah. Okay. I Can think it's, I think it's a quest to remain relevant. Um, right. I think institutions that the majority of the cultural institutions they care about something when they have found a way to to benefit from it. Um, so I'm, it's just waiting for the first museum to come with a Black Lives Matter exhibition, and not because I feel that like Black Lives should matter also on their board or on their staff. Um, but they should matter in like sense of ticket sales. And yeah. I think that is not something that is um, productive if it's about gaining trust. Um, and, and, and you also, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really um, striking critique because one of the things you also said just now is, is being better, being good does not need to, if I paraphrase you, need to come with a press release. That's basically what you're saying, right? So is yeah. it that you get the feeling that the press release then for you is, is exactly like the Black Lives Matter thing, which is going to be ticket sales and more visibility rather than committing to justice. Yeah, is that what you're saying? Yeah, because I feel like if you are uh, basically sent to do your homework, you can also do your homework in private. You know, the world doesn't have to bear witness to you needing to do the right thing. Um, I think that's, that's a very troubling notion. Um, and also because it feels like many of these institutions, like the people in positions of power, need to do so much work, um, but they still feel that they can be the director and the intern at the same time. Because when it comes to understanding these notions of justice, um, they're at like even maybe below the level of like entrance. Uh, it's, it's a very basic level. But the idea that you don't have to give up power as you, as you learn, that's just that's not, you know, something that all of us can count on, let me put it like that. Yeah. That's reserved for a very specific portion of society um, to not being able to function, but never lose your position. That's a luxury right. I cannot even imagine. <laughs> One of the things that I, 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 I in speaking with you um, more often, um, there is a, a certain kind of, um, all right, I, I want to now open to the conversation. So I'll, I'll, I'll invite everybody else and to ask questions. And then um, 
ask my question to you, um, or probably even leave that question to the end. Can I invite everybody else to turn their cameras on? Um, and in opening, what I wondered if any of you would like to ask the other person a question. Um, and don't feel pressured, <laughs> it's fine. And everything is possible, ask questions. This is one of the things that we're hoping to create and we know that there are over a hundred and I don't know how many people here, but we're open to create a space where we can be open about this, these issues, right? Because that is the only way we can learn. So where we can really listen. So are there questions that you want to ask of each other, of us, for example? I'm sure Charles would love a question. Guess not. But no pressure, Charles. No pressure, Charles. <laughs> um, no, I, I feel the pressure, certainly. Um, I mean, I suppose, Wayne, I'd like to ask you a question, actually. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Charles. That was not the intention, Charles, but that's, uh, we were here to listen. But go ahead and ask the question, yes. No, I mean, I think, I think this, 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 this question of is it, is, is, why don't what why why can we do anything other than burn down the institutions that we've got? Is there in in this discourse that we're developing, which I which I'm fully supportive of? I think we are, and I think you and I are trying to find alternatives to that because I think that that's in a way a little bit too easy. Also, we understand that institutions themselves will then will then. Uh, will will necessarily reconstruct themselves now they might reconstruct themselves better but there's also no guarantee about it um and i'm also conscious that stepping away which is something that i should do i've been in van Am museum way too long i think but if you know the experience of all the directors of museums recently most of whom have been appointed since i got was that there hasn't really been a shift in that they're still mostly men and they're all white so until that seems to be a prospect then i'm not sure that just stepping away or just burning it down is really is really sufficient, but I'm I'm open to persuasion. Really, I mean, I think if that's what if that's what in listening and caring about listening, that's the result. Then then we should facilitate that. No? Yeah, <laughs> it, it, that that doesn't really seem to be a question to me, but um, <laughs> but I can answer the question. Um, yeah, I mean, it is a I I, I hold a different kind of perspective to this. Um, should we burn the institutions down? I think there's a certain form of institutionality that we've come to know and come to live and come to be stubborn about that needs to be burned. That form of institutionality that is colonialist, that form of institutionality that is stubbornly persistent in, in reproducing certain, certain, certain things. Is it possible for the institution to be rehabilitated? Perhaps not. What I do believe, however, is that for, for these institutions anyway that we are a part of, is that it is precisely in an institution like this with so much crap, so much difficulty, so much history, so much whatever that I think that should be mobilized, that can be mobilized, that can be put out there to, 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 to ask the questions to society about not just the museum, because one of the things I think we do too often is that we abstract the museum away from its entangled relationship with what is happening in society. Mm. Human remains in my museum is not just an issue of the curator that is in my museum. Mm. Human remains is about a scientific logic, a racial logic that made it possible as a nation for human remains to be rested in some, some institution. So for me, working in this institution, the reason for having this conversation is not necessarily to think of abolishment as destruction in the physical sense, but abolishment as reorganization a serious decolonization that could suggest that the museum must be otherwise. And the question is, what is that otherwise? That is what we're interested in. And how does that otherwise work? So the answer to you from my perspective is no. But there is also another small answer, which is we're not going to burn them down in the next five years. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, so in that time, yes. we need to ensure that they stop doing violence. Mm -hmm. And I believe in that working to ensure that until that moment, we are as institutions, they are stopped doing violence. So that is my answer to you. But I was not here to talk about myself. I was here to um, hear from you. Um, Vincent, any responses to any, any other comments? Nothing. You can't. 
<laughs> I have. You, you were the first to speak, so that's why I'm. Exactly. I was very happy to hear the others. Uh, I was very. As it's always very lame to say it was very interesting, but it was actually very interesting, and some interesting, like very relevant points. And I'm very aware that I'm also like didn't really uh, address the subject of trust so much. Right. Uh, but maybe like the distrust distrust came from the from the words itself. But um, I like what Nosa said about the listening a lot, and I think Charles also addressed it very much. Um, and, but then maybe then then Simone also talked about it, you know, in the sense that the listening and then making a press release about that and then absorbing kind of what you heard. And then, you know, like I've, I'm, I've talked a lot about like having coffees with people, like being invited for coffee and like, you know, like all this stuff. And then this, this mistrust comes from like these coffees, like how they, like how they, uh, you know, like gain your knowledge and then absorb it and then like do something with it and then don't, in a way, give, give you anything back. And it's always like, it very much feels like a one way street. Yeah, and it's yeah. also like this, you know, like, hey, how do you think I should do this and this and this? And like, yeah, like maybe you shouldn't do it then if you don't know, if, or if you're going to ask me. And especially like, you know, if it's like just an advice position and you ask like five people around you who you know very well, but it's not like me, random person. Who happens to be uh, of color, or sorry, no, no, sorry for the use of the term, but um, I mean, like, you know, it's like, how do you relate to me? Like, we've been in this scene or this business or whatever you want to call it for, I don't know, like a decade together, and then like the first time we're gonna have coffee is like ten years in because somehow you became woke because Black Lives Matter, and um, like that's kind of you know, where this mistrust comes from. And then also like thinking about like this colonial endeavors about kind of erasure and stealing. And and it kind of comes to mind a lot of times when certain people do certain things uh, within art institutions. And I don't know, like this, this change part really strikes me always. Because yeah. there's like, of course, like this entire discourse of buying slowness and like stalling or like biding time or like making sure things don't happen too fast because maybe you can't catch up yourself or you don't know like where it's going to go when it's going to be fast and then maybe every step needs a press release also for yourself to reflect on it and but yeah i get i get a feeling about this press release i'm going to ask charles to talk about the press release but i don't want to put him in that position i want to ask something else because charles suggested something interesting about an ecology to create that kind of ecology i mean we we we, we do it in our own conversation our own questions of the, the lovely dutch word samiverking and what be taken that you know to, to work together um but is it possible that what you're also saying vincent but also simona and nosa is that museums spend so little time investing in, in developing that ecology of commonly practicing of fighting against injustice. And that what we do is that it becomes only, that I only call you at a particular moment. Do, does, can the trust be developed by, by that kind of e ecology, creating this, this, this collaborative framework of, of, of networks of people who are committed to this cause? and which is trust building. And if so, how do we do that um, to not only benefit the institution? Because how do you create an ecology where, I, sorry to say it so plot, flat, where the money, where you share the money or you share the benefits or you share the whatever, how do we do that? Simona? I love how you ask it and as if there's no, as if it's an easy, an easy answer. Uh, but I think the language of samaverking already states that you are not fully committed in incorporating that kind of change in the institution. Um, because if I'm working, for example, I'm working at Bombard Theater, I wouldn't say I'm collaborating with Ernestina. Ernestina is my colleague. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a different kind of language. So when you say samaverking, there's also this notion of you come in and there are limitations to what you can do, um, and then we can tell you to leave again. So I think that it says something about your intention of, of working with the person. Um, 
And with regards to trust, I always feel that when somebody from a museum, somebody in positions of power in a museum, asks that we abolish museums, it almost sounds a little bit like the, like some sort of dramatization of loss, um, because it it feels as if the idea that something cannot be um, led by a very Eurocentric structure is so absurd that the only other response to it is to then abolish it. Mm. So we're not even considering maybe hiring a different director, hiring different staff, hiring a different board. The response to whiteness not being in power is complete destruction. Um, whereas I would like to see, for example, somebody like Vincent as the director of an art museum. It doesn't have to be abolished. I would like to see somebody else in a position of power and then see what happens. All right. I mean, I, you, 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 you can't, you can't, <laughs> you can't say Charles did that here eh, because the question of abolition. No, 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 oh, no, no, no. <laughs> It's always. No, no, no. We, we That's started. Not what I said. <laughs> no. We started that question. Um, um, no, but I wanted to tap into the question, so it wasn't a response to yeah, Charles yeah, yeah. should no, give up his fine. position for Fintan, yeah. if you want no. to, but no, but it's, it's a response <laughs> to what you said. But okay, um, no, sir, you have any questions of the others, any of Charles, for example? Um, no, I just, I kind of just like um, what Simon said by, um, yeah, you shouldn't sort of like, I think the one is stupid to sort of like, you shouldn't advertise the fact that you're doing the um, right thing. And um, in the um, area of uh, Sam and Vod, and Vek, working together, yeah. I think that um, because someone in the um, group um, in the Q and A said that is, is it possible for uh, for there to be institutional change without um, removing um, the um, leadership? Well, I think. Um, yeah, if, if if these guys don't want to change, they have to go. And I say guys because it's it's I'm sorry to put it so bluntly, it's, it's all the white men being there, you know. And if they don't want to change, then they have to go because this is the only way that we can work together and yeah, just train out there. Okay, maybe I'm rambling a little bit. Okay. So oh, I, 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 one of the things that I've I've often wondered though, and I'm going to throw this out at you because you know, in a way the question of, of getting rid of institutions is also a question of um, whether or not the structure is so stubborn that um, changing a director or change, replacing a white director with a person of color doesn't necessarily change the institution because the institution has its own complex entanglements, right? So it is, it is also about what the structure is and what it does to others who come in that makes it stubborn and not necessarily only um, in its total ab abolitionment. But Charles, you said something, I think it was you who said something interesting, which is, or probably one, uh, somebody else who said interesting. No, it was Vincent who spoke about the fact that one can talk about a director very often, but the institution is much bigger than that. That one talks about a minister, but actually there is a ministry <laughs> and it is the ministry that is this, and actually what, what, what ministries often do is that you ensure that the minister can have impact, but that the ministry stays as a structure that continues, right? So that once the minister changes, there is continuity. Is what you're also suggesting that it is not just to look at the director, but to look in how the institution is structured and what is at stake in those positions where decisions are made that are not only directorial. Is that what you were suggesting? Basically. Very much. Yeah. yeah, totally. Like, um, that's where like the, the decisions, like of course, like the director like sets out lines and has a lot of influence. But at the same time on like small daily gestures, it's like that entire ministry, which is called in this sense a museum that's all these individuals doing things and making decisions and maybe having coffees with people or declining coffees or um, inviting certain people or and others not like it's all these decisions that are being made all the time and it's like these decisions where like the key is I think and in that sense in all these people because I think it's really about the individual in this sense and of course it's like a structure and there's like um, different mechanisms at play internally as well but then in the end it's still the the, the individuals doing 
certain things and it's just you know like if you have a someone at a desk who somehow uh, isn't welcoming that's already like a lot and you cannot blame the director for that because the director probably doesn't even hire the person personally but you know it's like something that that an institution does and that's already where it started and it's like on desk level or like front level and it goes up all the way and the front you can see but like all the other stuff you cannot even see and that's why also like these weird cosmetics of changing names and I don't know like um, like s small like no small not to say small hires because that's like not that's kind of offensive to people but like one hire for example that's I really feel sorry for the person who got, who gets hired because you're they're only going to be the only black person in the entire institution and you're going to like solve all those problems like and everybody going to look at you. Uh, when there's like some type of question or uh, because now there's this one person who can solve it for them and that that must be such an intense position and so I think that there needs to be more change than that and Charles um, in response to that Charles um, how do you how do you imagine as you know as yourself a director but but creating that particular kind of critical mass both internal and external to be able to make change possible because vincent is suggesting that the one diversity officer doesn't work you are suggesting that actually it is in the coalition building in the in the in the broad ecology of anti-colonial work that will make it work but what do you think is that how do you how do you create that kind of critical mass where that big elephant is changed um is it I, yeah, I think, again it's, it's difficult to avoid repeating this idea of sort of small steps that lead to it all across a broad range of fronts you know so clearly employment issues are one thing and i agree with vincent that there's huge pressure if one person has to sort of represent this idea or be the diversity officer i mean these positions are you know more or less un, you know they're, they're impossible to to uh, to do well um and they also create the exactly the wrong kind of expectations in which then solutions are are, are um sort of outsourced to one particular department or one particular position I think, you know, some of the stuff that we've been doing recently in the museum is very much about retraining and going through processes with the with critical visitors, with building a city board, um, with, with, I mean, what I would call processes of listening and caring, but they are inevitably about, you know, simple things like we have two uh, maps on the on the wall in the museum, one of which is the, the birthplace of uh, artists in the collection of Van Abbe, and one is the birthplace of citizens in Eindhoven. And what always has been understood in the internal dialogues of the Museum of Van Abbe is that it's an international collection in a provincial city. What you see from this is that it's a provincial collection in an international city. Actually, Eindhoven is far broader. <clears throat> now making that point, not only to our visitors, but also internally, then builds a kind of justification for discussing these very, these very issues. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you have that, that process of... of um, of collectively, you know, coming together as a team, and now it's mostly over, over Zoom and things like that, which is also problematic, I think, because it becomes very, very pragmatic the the the, the conversations that are had on this technology, but uh, but actually coming together and understanding ourselves as being, you know, riddled with colonialism, riddled with a with a racist modernity, which has produced the very institution that we have, acknowledging that is a step towards um, not necessarily changing it, but towards allowing change to happen from the outside. And I think that's where I would say not about Samovec. I think, I think, I think, um, I think Simone is absolutely right that that can, can become again a sort of rhetorical device in which power doesn't shift. But I think if we understand an ecosystem as interdependency, then what, would, what it would mean is that a museum couldn't do anything without that kind of um, collective endeavor, even within the art world, with institutions, collections like yours, with institutions that produce art that are smaller scale institutions, artists initiatives or whatever around the world. And that that interdependency is much more clearly acknowledged financially in terms of the, the, the flows of money, not necessarily to the gallery system, but more to an ecosystem that we would want to have. Um, but intellectually, um, and also in terms of the the, 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 the the productive possibilities and the reason that museum can exist at all. I think once you understand an ecosystem in which the small uh, enables the large and the large is dependent on the small, then, then I think 
you can talk about trying to build a form of trust, but you need to demonstrate it. Yeah, this is all rhetoric at the moment. You need to demonstrate it and show it working. And I think that's the challenge that we've got ahead um, in order for that to, in any way to be built up. And, 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 you know, eventually I agree. I think, in, you know, my task is to leave, absolutely. You know, but, but, uh, but I think the question is when, yeah, then the question is not if, and that Vincent takes over. But the question is, would Vincent take over now with the structures in place of the city council in Eindhoven making those decisions? And I, you know, for all his talents, I'm a little bit nervous that that wouldn't take place given the people who are making that decision. Yeah, um, I, there is one, two questions that I'd like to close with. Um, one, um, actually this one was for, um, focused at you, Vincent. And then the last one I want to ask of Simona, but it is actually related to something Vincent said earlier. But Vincent, um, somebody asked, what would your, it is two questions. Um, the question is basically, should there be more museums dedicated to um, um, particular communities? Would, would that kind of institution help to, to shift um, larger institutions? So, so to create, for example, as in New York, the Museo del Barrio, or you could think of uh, uh, institutions who has Innova in, in, in London at some point, would that kind of institution help to shift the narrative enough? So that's one of the questions that is asked. And what do you think about that as a strategy, um, which is in a certain way also moving away from the, or, um, Havona, the, Havona, um, the regular institutions oh, and creating yeah. other ones? What do you think about that? Mm, I think like, the Anglo context is something different. I think that concept of community functions different in the Netherlands. Um, and it's something that seems to me at least uh, only recently becoming more present. Um, so in that sense, I find it hard to like really talk about like what a community is and also that sense of community. I'm not sure how how, how strong it is in the way like this, these, let's say migrant uh, based um, countries like the US, and I'm not sure if migrant base is a really nice description, but you know, right. yeah. Um, um, like how these came about, like the support systems were different. And I think in the Netherlands, that that's something else. But at the same time, I think it's maybe it's, it's not just like for and from, but it could be something led. Like I, I, it would be interesting to have a have an have a space that's led by um, people of color or people with like let's say right. migrant backgrounds. The way like the policy is now framing them, and because it would do something different. And it's also like now you're dependent on like all these bigger institutions, so you have to work with certain museums, just because that's like how the fr the the framework or like the infrastructure functions. But then they probably get more money for it because they work with you than that you're getting that than the amount that you're getting. Yeah. So mm -hmm. in that sense, and they can like, you know, tick off boxes that have the diversity quota or like whatever they got, inclusivity or and um so if you like take that away from them, then they need to change because then they really need to do something. Yeah. Um I, I want to close Thanks, Vincent. I, I mean I like how you, you you think through the question also of need not, not necessarily for or by but for but led by and what is at stake in that and how that might create a different kind of institution for a different kind of framing. I want to close with a question, which is um, one of the things that happened in the aftermath of um, um, the Black Lives Matter mobilization recently, and Vincent, you kind of alluded to this, is the, the overwhelming responses, which meant that, and Simone you also did it, uh, meant that institutions were as you would have you may have said it um, um, benefiting from you know showing black artists buying black artwork um, you know as Simona said might have done an exhibition called Black Lives Matter um, but also the idea that has recently emerged around the the concentration on um, on margin, the marginalization and violence against people of color, right? So a lot of museums are sit in that. Let's talk about the slavery, the colonialism. Let's talk about the uh, marginalization and violence, whatever. 
can you, Simona, imagine another kind of way the museums can engage with Black lives that, that is not always so connected to the spectacularity of violence? Is it possible to, to move away from this attendance to violence as a part of the narrative of how museums change by thinking differently about how we can um, connect with quote unquote black lives or, 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 or the lives of those who are marginalized? Can museums, the, yeah, go ahead. No, go, no, finish your no, question. No, go ahead, I'm said enough. Uh, I think it depends on their dedication to truly engage with the everydayness of black people. Um, because otherwise you will keep hopping from spectacle to spectacle. Um, and what has been said before and many times also like outside of this conversation, is there an interest in black people that um, goes beyond the imagination of the people who work at the museum? So maybe not everyday hip hop, but maybe we wanna go see an exhibition about rock um, and then not Afropunk, but a specific kind of, so not the overcommensalization of black people. Um, I think if there's a dedication to that, um, change can actually happen. Yeah, for sure. Um, but can that happen with the people who are sitting in the positions now? That I don't really know. Um, but I think Charles said something important with regards to worrying about uh, what if a new director comes and then, you know, the person is facing the municipality. I think that really illustrates on how many levels uh, things need to change. Because otherwise you will remain the one person fighting against so many things. Um, so there's, it's not the time to be taking small steps because then small steps cannot create um, big spaces for people. And we need more people in more positions of power. So I think that's a very important point. And I wish we had more time to, uh, to dive into that. Yeah, I, <laughs> this is an ongoing conversation for us. It won't stop now. So um, our, our, our next conversation, which is going to be in, in November, I think November 19, 18, 19, will be about um, anti-racist collections, collecting and anti-racist curation. Now we are, trying to invite um, curators who've been working in this and what it might mean, or how, we might, uh, how we might do that. So in a sense, um, we will have time to speak to this, what you're speaking to, but, but I think Charles has a point mm. that the question of coloniality is so big. <laughs> it is so massive that it is not, it is about the museum, but it is the museum articulated in a massive structure. Mm. And, and the question is, what does the museum do to be able to change that structure? And what do, but it is also so is, what do we do as a certain kind of coalition of people who are changing, not just the internal structure, but what is happening outside of us as well? I think that that is very, very important. Because yeah, sure. structures hold us, ensnare us. No, sir, you're from, you, you are doing your PhD in England. Is there anything you have spoken from your experience being in the Netherlands as well. Is there yeah. any last point that you want to um, leave with us? I leave in, in our hospitality, I leave the word to you for your last point. Anything, <laughs> any advice? Yes. And no, uh, pressure, um, no pressure, no pressure, no pressure. That's really kind of you. I think uh, I just wanted to um, stick, um, continue from what um, Simon said with um, whether um, these institutions are really interested in learning about um, black people. I think part of the problem is that um, for a lot of institutions and for a lot of white people, um, black people and all that um, non-white people are uh, a thing of mystery, uh, something, yeah, a thing of mystery. They don't really know a lot about, about us. And I think that that's where um, the problem um, um, begins. The fact that there is a, um, uh, I think in Dutch it's called in Knips, which is, I think, a distorted understanding of what blackness means. And a lot of um, uh, understanding of blackness that these institutions um, have comes from slavery and colonialism. So I think, because um, I started with decolonization, but I think um, one of the things that could also happen, one of the steps that, could, that can take place is also um, a reimagination of blackness. And I think, um, yeah, that could also be um, something to help with, um, yeah, this summit, the working together and, um, yeah, listening and um, bettering ourselves. So I think I'm just going to end with okay. this. All right, I, I'd like to thank you all. I mean, from this, you know, Charles and I saw each other at another event, which, <laughs> 
which was another spectacular event, which was quite difficult, where the question of listening came out, came out um, as well. Um, and, 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 and that has come through over and over in our conversation and what might it mean as an institution to listen, but not just to listen, because there's a certain sense of listening. To be honest with many of you, if you're not anthropologists, you can say, but anthropology has always been a practice of listening, but it has also been a very, very troubled discipline, right? So there is listening and there is listening. So what does it mean to listen? and to try and do and enact something out of that listening that pushes towards a certain set, sense of justice. Charles, you probably did, did it nicely when you, in your second point, when you mentioned again, reiterated the coloniality of the very institutions in which we work, that that is how we are based. We are based upon that. And that, that coloniality maps onto a societal coloniality, which makes it hard sometimes to maneuver. But that must be the starting point internally for us to understand what is at stake in the changes that we want to do. But if I were to listen to Simona, a part of the change cannot necessarily be because we want to rehabilitate the institution for the institution's self, but rather because we want to imagine other worlds of equity that is outside the institution, that is outside of the institution, and not necessarily embedded in the furtherance of the institution, but perhaps in the love, joy, hope, equality of black lives that are really supposed to matter outside the institution itself. And the question then is whether or not even this conversation is a navel gazing, um, internalized look at ourselves, which takes away from the real work that is to be done outside. That is one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is to suggest, and I really like this idea, and I hope you will also feel this, that what we're trying to do in today, like other times, is to create exactly the ecology, that ecology where we are together, and I love this word, complicit in fashioning the future that we hope that we, that we can have, right? And what might that mean? So I make you complicit this afternoon. In a, in a better tomorrow. Like Simone, you can deny my complicity, it's all right. <laughs> I see it on your face. But um, we, we, we must commit or accept that this is not a livable world as we have it now. And that's one of the beauties about activism. I think activism is often understood as something to be anxious about. Whereas for us here, activism is nothing but an impatience with what is now for a possible tomorrow that must be better. And that I think we need to commit to. Thank you all. And let us, let me say that let us drink together. I invite you all to dinner together where we can talk, drink, exchange, literally touch each other in the real because, the, or, all right, whatever. <laughs> Shake hands in the real um, when this moment of, of, of COVID-19 has passed because it, it leaves us precarious, but there is a future that we need to commit to. Thank you all, until next time. All right, bye-bye.